Welcome back, everyone, to the By Way of Command podcast. I am your host, Jacob Ryder, and I am so glad that we're continuing on on our Lectures on Faith series. This is Lecture on Faith number three, The Character of God. This is actually a fairly short one, um, but one that I think is really interesting. We're going to start here as we get into this lecture and the next few lectures here as we finish out the Lectures on Faith. We're going to learn more about the nature of God, his character, his attributes, and our relationship to him. We've already talked about in the first two lectures what is faith and what is the object of our faith, or who is the object of our faith, really. Um, But now we're going to get into more of the nitty-gritty. We're going to get more into the details of who God is and who we are in relationship to them. So let's get right into it. This is the Character of God, Lecture 3 of the Lectures on Faith. Starting right off the top in verse 1, it says, In the second lecture it was shown how it was that the knowledge of the existence of God came into the world, and by what means the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men, that such a being did actually exist, and that it was by reason of the knowledge of his existence that there was a foundation laid for the exercise of faith in him, as the only being in whom faith could center for life and salvation." For faith could not center in a being of whose existence we had no idea. Because this idea of his existence in the first instance is essential to the exercise of faith in him. Romans 10.14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Or one sent to tell them. So then, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Let us here observe that that three things are necessary in in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. First, the idea that he actually exists. Kind of a no-brainer, but yep. Secondly, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. And this, this is what is so hotly debated amongst all religions, um, not just between Latter-day Saints and Protestants uh, or Catholics or or other Christian denominations, but even just in general between Abrahamic religions, uh, between all other religions on this planet, is what is the correct understanding of God's character, perfections, and attributes? Who is God, and what are the specific characteristics that make him God? Um, This is what is uh, really exciting to talk about, and I think um, as we've um, gone into a little bit of theology in uh, the past videos, we've talked about some of these attributes and some of these things that make up the character of God and who he is that I think are so important. And quite frankly, um, Joseph Smith did so much with the revelations he received in putting together a clear picture of who God is, his nature and his attributes, which we're going to read about here. Uh, But he put together so much for us to to understand who God is that honestly, I think, sometimes gets um, overlooked or um, not appreciated as much as it should be. Uh, by some Latter-day Saints, but certainly by the rest of Christendom. Uh, In verse 5, it says, Thirdly, an actual knowledge that the course of life which he is pursuing is according to his will. For without an acquaintance with these three important facts, the faith of every rational being must be imperfect and unproductive. But with this understanding, it can become perfect and fruitful, abounding in righteousness in the, unto the praise and glory of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Having previously been made acquainted with the way the idea of his existence came into the world, as well as the fact of his existence, we shall proceed to examine his character, perfections, and attributes, in order that this class may see not only the just grounds which they have for the exercise of faith in him, for life and salvation, but for the reasons that all the world, also as far as the idea of his existence extends, may have to exercise faith in him, the father of all living. As we have been indebted 
to a revelation which, which God made of himself to his creatures in the first instance. For the idea of his, of his existence, so in like manner we are indebted to the revelations which he has given to us for a correct understanding of his character, perfections, and attributes. Because without the revelations which he has given to us, no man, by searching, could find out God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9-11 through 11 says, But as it is written, I hath, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed unto the, them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God no, no man knows but the Spirit of God. Having said so much, we proceed to examine the character which the revelations have given of God. Moses gives us the following account in Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord God, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Psalms 103, 6-8 says, The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Psalms 103, 17-18 says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Psalms 92, quote, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Hebrews 1 verses 10 through 12. Quote, and you, Lord, in the beginning have laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall remain, and they shall wax old as a garment, and as a vesture shall you fold them up, and they shall be changed. But you are the same, and your, yours shall not fail. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Malachi 3.6 For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Doctrine and Covenants section 3, commencing in the second verse, says, For God does not walk in crooked paths, neither does he turn to the right hand nor to the left, or vary from that which he has said, therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Um, just a quick note here before we keep going in the lectures on faith. Um, I've recently been studying some Hugh Nibley, um, some some of his uh, research and, and the things that he's put together in some of his books. Um, this course is one eternal round. Um, this comes up in scripture in uh, various places all throughout the Bible. Uh, as well as the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, they they all have this um, some variation of this um, this course uh, idea. This w course is one eternal round. God is is one eternal round. Um, and what's interesting about the word course is in an ancient context um, in Aramaic or, or um, even Greek, uh, I believe. Some of the, the words that are used that are translated into course um, actually refer to a circle, the, the, a pattern of a, of a circle. And so it's one eternal round uh, in this circular pattern, circular formation. I just thought that's interesting. I'm going to talk more about that um, in a future video uh, fairly soon, I think, because there's some very interesting things going on there. But I just wanted to point that out, that the word course when it talks about one eternal round is actually the course itself is a circular formation. And if we think about the worship of God and all things denote the creation of God or denote the existence of God, we think about the very universe itself um, orbits one another. The stars and planets orbit 
around the sun in our universe, in our, in our uh, galaxy. Um, these patterns that we orbit around things um, is an interesting one to, to think about in our Latter-day Saint cosmology. Anyways, that was a side tangent. Uh, forgive me for that. Doctrine and Covenants section 35 verse 1 says, Listen to the voice of the Lord your God, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, whose course is one eternal round, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Um, I know there are people who would point to this verse, uh, particularly those who are not Latter-day Saints, to say God is not a man. And they would stop it there to say, see, we are not even in remotely the same species or kind as God. He is not a man, and we are not God. We're completely different entities, um, to which we would say, um, keep reading the verse. Um, he's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God is a God of righteousness and honesty and truth. Um, but this verse does not have anything to do with the nature of God in terms of his, um, his species or kind, um, that, that, um, many would attribute this verse to mean, uh, first John four, eight says he that loves not knows not God for God is love. Again, if you were a pantheist or, or something similar, uh, you'd think God is in everything right? God's in this, this webcam. God's in this light. Um, he's in, uh, my dresser. He's in this microphone. God is in everything. Um, God is love. And so any love, whatever kind of love that is that we show to people, that's God. Um, I think again, this would be something of a mistranslation, uh, or, or a misinterpretation of what this is saying. My personal opinion, um, but this, um, he that loves not knows not God, for God is love. I think, I think this more adequately can be represented in the idea that all true Christ-like love comes from God. And as we love others with that charity, that true Christ-like love, the pure love of Christ, um, we come to know God. I think that's more accurately what is being uh, said here. Acts 10 34, quote, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. From the foregoing testimonies, we learn the following things respecting the character of God. First, that he was God before the world was created and the same God that he was after it was created. Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in goodness, and that he was so from, the, from everlasting and will be to everlasting. Thirdly, that he changes not, neither is there variableness with him, but that he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round, without variation." Fourthly, that he is a God of truth and cannot lie. Fifthly, that he is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. Sixthly, that he is love. An acquaintance with these attributes in the divine character is essentially necessary in order that the faith of any rational being can center in him for life and salvation. For if he did not, in the first instance, believe him to be God, that is, the creator and upholder of all things, he could not center his faith in him for life and salvation, for fear there should be a greater than he, who would thwart all his plans, and he, like the gods of the heathen, would be unable to fulfill his promises. But seeing he is God over all, from everlasting to everlasting, the creator and upholder of all things, no such fear can exist in the minds of those who put their trust in him, so that in this respect, their faith can be without wavering. But secondly, unless he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness, 
Such is the weakness of human nature, and so great the frailties and imperfections of men that unless they believed that these excellencies existed in the divine character, the faith necessary to salvation could not exist. For doubt would take the place of faith, and those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation. If it were not for the idea which they have of the excellency of the character of God, that he is slow to anger and long-suffering and of a forgiving disposition, and does forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. An idea of these facts does away doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. Um, just a, a, a note here. It's human nature to beat ourselves up and get really down on ourselves. I do that all the time. That's my admission. Um, it can be a, a struggle to admit to ourselves that God is capable of forgiving us or that he's capable of loving us. Um, because we feel guilty sometimes about how we don't measure up to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Um, we recognize our sins and our weaknesses. Um, and so there's a struggle here to try and truly have faith and believe that God is of a forgiving disposition, that his natural disposition, his, uh, his default setting, so to speak, is to forgive. But I think the scriptures lay out time after time, again and again, this pattern of forgiveness. Um, I think the scriptures, particularly the New Testament and the Book of Mormon, show us that God, in fact, does have a forgiving disposition, that he is long-suffering, and that as long as we seek to do his will, as long as we seek to repent, as long as we're humble and we come to him, he will forgive us. Um, he will not condemn us for our weaknesses if we are humble and come to him. His hand is stretched out still, um, always to us. We get literally infinite chances to turn to him and repent and be forgiven. Um, and I know this can be difficult for some of us to grasp that idea because we very easily recognize our own weaknesses and are quick to beat ourselves up for them. Um, so this is a challenge for a lot of us. But the scriptures teach us time and again that his true disposition, his default setting, so to speak, is to forgive. That should be enough for us to start with, to come to him. No matter what we've done or, or um, how we falter and how we think of ourselves, we can be forgiven, and in time we should be able to forgive ourselves if we've already gone to the Savior, if we've already gone to our Father in Heaven for forgiveness. We should be able to um, come clean to Him with everything, lay it all on His shoulders. Um, Christ took upon Himself our pains and our sicknesses and our afflictions, every bit as much as our sins. Um, to hold on to those, to retain those, because of some feelings of guilt or inadequacy would be to defeat the entire purpose of the atonement of Christ. He did that for us so that we wouldn't have to hold on to those burdens. He wishes to make our burdens light. Anyway, let's, let's, let's continue on here. Um, we don't have too much more. 
in verse 21, it says, but it is equally as necessary that men should have the idea that he is a God who changes not in order to have faith in him as it is to have the idea that he is gracious and long suffering for without the idea of unchangeableness in the character of the deity, doubt would take the place of faith. But with the idea that he changes not faith lays hold upon the excellencies in his character with unshaken confidence believing he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round. And again, the idea that he is a God of truth and cannot lie is equally as necessary to the exercise of faith in him as the idea of his unchangeableness. For without the idea that he was a God of truth and cannot lie, the confidence necessary to be placed in his word in order to the exercise of faith in him could not exist. But having the idea that he is not man, that he can lie, it gives power to the minds of men to exercise faith in him. But it is also necessary that men should have an idea that he is no respecter of persons. For with the idea of all the other excellencies in his character, and this one wanting, men could not exercise faith in him because if he were a respecter of persons, they could not tell what their privileges were nor how far they were authorized to exercise faith in him, or whether they were authorized to do it at all. Uh, but all must be confusion. But no sooner are the minds of men made acquainted with the hard truth on this point, that he is no respecter of persons, than they see that they have authority by faith to lay hold on eternal life, the richest boon of heaven, because God is no respecter of persons, and that every man in every nation has an equal privilege." This right here is a, a very important point to be made, um, particularly for the reason that this idea here, God is no respecter of persons, and, and I'll read through part of this again, it completely destroys some of the false doctrines that we might have, that we might conjure up in our minds about our status before God. Whether we're talking about the, uh, the, the Jewish people at the time of Christ who were very much of the opinion that they were of the divine birthright as children of Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, they felt that, you know, we're already the covenant people, we're living righteously, you know, quote unquote, um, keeping the law of Moses, and so, you know, we're, we're all good. God respects that covenant he made with us because we're the children of Abraham. Uh, but what does John the Baptist tell them? Yeah, that's nice. You realize God could turn these stones into children of Abraham. Um, just because you are born in the covenant, just because you are part of the covenant in some way, just because you have some uh, famous person in your family or in your ancestry, just because maybe you have Abraham to your father, or Joseph Smith, or Brigham Young, or Russell M. Nelson, just because you're related to somebody, or you, or you are the offspring of somebody big and important and famous or whatever, doesn't mean jack for your own salvation. God is no respecter of persons. He expects all of us to approach the throne of God in humility uh, and lowliness of heart. Um, we all have to um, bend the knee and confess Christ as the Savior. Um, this also, on the other hand, goes to uh, another very big and popular doctrine that is taught amongst the Reformed Christians, uh, the Calvinists particularly, of this idea of the let the elect being those that God has predestined for uh, eternity in heaven, and those who are not the elect are predestined for uh, damnation in hell. God has already predetermined, he predestined who he's decided to save and who he's decided to send to hell, regardless of what you have done. And it's only because he has predestined you for heaven that he has granted you the, um, the irresistible grace 
to have faith in him and repent of your sins. If you're someone who has repented of your sins and you accepted Christ as your savior and you are following him, it's only because God has already predestined you for heaven and has imbued you with the irresistible grace necessary to actualize his predestined destiny for you. This is a form of respecting persons, or rather respecting uh, the predestination uh, of, of God in persons. This is also a false doctrine. This is so false. Um, and I, I'm, 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 I'm not wanting to be really aggressive here on this point. I, I don't mean anything um, offensive to our Calvinist friends, our Reformed uh, Christian friends. Um, I, I, I'm not attacking you, um, but I think it's so important that we, when we break down what predestination really is and what it means, it means that there's no agency and that any choice we make to follow Christ is only the after effect of having already been predestined and imbued with literally irresistible grace that he gives us. And were we able to to uh, have our own will or our own say in the matter, it wouldn't matter because we would not be able to resist the grace that he has imbued with us uh, or, or has given to us to follow him. But any works of righteousness we do, any faith we exercise in him only comes after he has already predestined us for heaven. That is completely backwards. God gives us the agency, the free moral agency to choose to put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of the blood of Christ or not. That's our choice. But if we're predestined, we have no choice and therefore no agency. Um, this idea is, um, is one that I think has plagued much of Christianity in recent uh, generations. Um, and it all comes back to this idea of God being a respecter of persons or not a respecter of persons rather, um, that gets twisted in some of these doctrines that, um, that, that have come out of, let's say Calvinism and, or other, uh, reformed traditions, um, that is eerily similar to, or a reflection of the same philosophies or ideas that infiltrated the Jewish people who believed they had Abraham to their father and could do no wrong. Um, there's, there's some mirroring there of, of uh, a similar type of uh, belief about oneself. We see it also, by the way, in the Book of Mormon, uh, in the middle of, of uh, the Book of Alma, in, in chapter, uh, is it 30, 31? Um, Alma and Amulek lead a, a team of missionaries, um, and they, they find these people worshiping up on this big Ramiumptum, right? Um, you know, they get up there and they all pray the same prayer, you know, oh, thank you God for making us so much better than everybody else and for predestinating, predestining us for salvation and damning everybody else to hell. Oh, we're so glad that you've made us, uh, saved and, and everybody else is going to hell. It's the same predestination uh, philosophy in these people in the Book of Mormon. Um, anyways, I digress. That We'll continue on. In verse 24, it says, And lastly, but not less important to the exercise of faith in God is the idea that he is of love, or that he is love. For with all the other excellencies in his character, without this one to influence them, they could not have such powerful dominion over the minds of men. But when the idea is planted in the mind that he is love, who cannot see the just ground that men of every nation, kindred and tongue, have to exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal, eternal life? From the above description of the character of the deity which is given him in the revelations to men, there is a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in him among every people, nation, and kindred, from age to age and from generation to generation. Let us here observe 
that the foregoing is the character which is given of God in his revelations to the former day saints. And it is also the character which is given of him in his revelations to the latter day saints. So that the saints of former days and those of latter days are both alike in this respect. The quote, latter day saints, unquote, having as good grounds to exercise faith in God as the former day saints had, because the same character is given of him to both. All right, that was lecture three. Now we're getting in, into a few questions here. I won't go through all of them. Uh, what was shown in the second lecture? It was shown how the knowledge of the existence of God came into the world. What's the effect of the idea of his existence among men? It lays the foundation for the exercise of faith in him. Question three, is the idea of his existence in the first instance necessary in order for the exercise of faith in him? It is. How do you prove it? By the 16th chapter to Romans and verse 14. Um, I'm not going to read that. You can read that on your own if you'd like. Um, question five, how many things are necessary for us to understand respecting the deity and our relation to him in order that we may exercise faith in him for life and salvation? Three, what are they? Well, first, that God does actually exist. Secondly, correct ideas of his character, his perfections and attributes. And thirdly, that the course which we pursue is according to his mind and will. Those are the three things that are necessary for us to understand. Uh, to exercise faith in him for life and salvation. Question seven, would the idea of any one or two of the above mentioned things enable a person to exercise faith in God? It would not, for without the idea of them all, faith would be imperfect and unproductive. So you could exercise faith in Christ without really knowing about his attributes or his character, but it would be imperfect and unproductive. Question eight, would an idea of these three things lay a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in God so as to obtain life and salvation? It would, for by the idea of these three things, faith could become perfect and fruitful, abounding in righteousness unto the praise and glory of God. It's interesting that it talks about faith becoming perfect. Um, we often think about faith as, as um, having a hope of things we haven't seen. Um, but I've talked before uh, in previous videos on the channel. Um, it's more of a spectrum, I think, in going from a position of of pure faith, ha having no, um, um, having very little, I should say, um, tangible evidence supporting your faith or your belief in something, but rather acting out whatever light and knowledge you've already received in your life. And as we continue to do that over time, as we continue to act on the faith that we have, or act rather on the light and knowledge that we have, God grants unto us further light and knowledge. And as we continue to exercise faith in the light and knowledge that he gives us time and time again, that light and knowledge builds and builds until the perfect day, um, when eventually we'll all stand before God and have a perfect knowledge of him. Question nine, how are we to be made acquainted with the before mentioned things respecting the deity and respecting ourselves? Answer is by revelation. Could these things be found out by any other means than by revelation? They could not. Now we could justify a purely logical or intellectual um, case to be made for the existence of God and his nature, his attributes, um, the, the doctrine taught in the scriptures. We could reason these things out intellectually, um, but we can't exercise faith without receiving revelation, without receiving the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and to enlighten our minds um, in some manner. How do you prove it? By the scriptures, Job 11, 7 through 9, and 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11. What things could we do in the revelations of God respecting his character? Or excuse me, what, what things do we learn in the revelations of God respecting his character? We learn the, the six following things. First, that he was a God before the world was created, and the same God that he was after it was created. 
Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in goodness, and that he was so from everlasting and will be so to everlasting. Thirdly, that he changes not, neither is there variableness with him, and that his course is one eternal round. Fourthly, that he is a God of truth and cannot lie. Fifthly, that he is no respecter of persons. And sixthly, that he is love. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. There's a handful more questions. Um, I would encourage everybody, if you're going to follow along with us, please do. Um, and share your insights with us in the comment section of, of these videos. Um, go to lecturesonfaith.com to read them for free. You can read the Lectures on Faith along with us or on your own time. Um, and again, uh, share these videos with others. If, if you know somebody who would also benefit or who would just simply enjoy uh, reading the Lectures on Faith with us, Send them uh, these videos. Send them these videos and share them with them. Um, the more the merrier. And if you guys have any insights into some of these verses of Scripture or some of the things that are talked about um, by the, the early saints in the lectures on faith, by all means, let me know in the comments below. I love learning from you guys. You guys are honestly uh, oftentimes much smarter than I am and have great insights into things. I learn a lot from you guys, and so... I appreciate when you have things to say in the comments and when you, you leave some of your insights. I do appreciate those. And that's going to wrap up our video for today. That was lecture three in the lectures on faith, the character of God. Let me know what you guys think and any insights you had. Like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video, and I will see you in the next video.